Okay, it is one o'clock, so we will be getting started. And you can see the tech check on the screen, and you can see the microphone icon on the bottom left of the screen. It's a toggle button, you click on and off, and um, then your microphone will go on and off. And we would ask if you could please leave your microphones muted during uh, the session when you're not talking. And there's a video button where you can click on and off. And we'll have chat. You can use the chat throughout the session. And we have a number of people from our Center of Innovative Teaching and Learning online to help with the session today. And I could ask um, Megan and Mike uh, if the recording is started, please. Yeah, we're recording. OK, thank you. Welcome to the Spring 2021 Teaching Effectiveness Institute, Creating Communities of Hope. We're so excited to have you all online today. We have a great group from disciplines across NIU and from every college, and we're so excited that each of you have taken time during this very busy meetings week and um, prep for your spring semester to join us today for our annual um, biannual Teaching Effectiveness Institute. My name is Yvonne Johnson and I'm the Multimodal Teaching Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning and I will be the moderator for the session today. I would like to express my sincere thanks to my colleagues Megan Holt and Mike Taylor from the Center of Innovative Teaching and Learning for helping me with preparations for this event today. It's been a great um, time working with you all. Thank you very much. A quick overview of the session. We will have um, introductory remarks from our provost, Dr. Beth Ingram. Um, I will introduce the speaker, um, Dr. Kevin Gannon. We'll have several different interactive sessions this afternoon and the event will conclude at 4 p.m. At this time, I would like to introduce our Executive Vice President and Provost, Dr. Beth Ingram, who will be providing some introductory remarks. Please go ahead, Provost Ingram. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne, and thank you to all the organizers for uh, the session today. I know it takes a lot of work to pull something like this together, and I, I appreciate those efforts. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Spring Teaching Effectiveness Institute. It's great to see faculty from a, across the colleges and across the disciplines coming together to share information and learn from each other. I wanted to join you briefly to express my sincere gratitude for your efforts over the last year, which were nothing short of amazing. We've concluded not, one, not just one, but two extraordinary uh, challenging semesters. Uh, but throughout that disruption, uh, your patience, kindness, and collegiality have been a constant source of inspiration to me. Many of you have found uh, incredibly innovative solutions to teaching remotely, and I know that many of you are anxious to get back into the classroom face-to-face -face with our students. And I know that you're committed to our students, and I can count on you to create high-quality learning experiences for them. And your participation in this is evidence of that. You'll engage them, challenge them, transform them, whatever form your classroom takes. I think the topic for this year's Institute is especially welcome, creating communities of hope. Uh, I don't know, most of you probably don't know this, but I taught statistics for many, many years. And I always thought of the first day of class as one that was full of hopes. My hope that the semester would go well, uh, that I would engender in my students the same love for data that, that I had always had. And for my students, I'm sure it was a hope that statistics would not be quite as difficult as all their friends said it would be. I think that part of creating a community within a classroom is adopting the right paradigm in the relationship between the instructor and the student, uh, moving from sage on the stage to, to guide on the side, as the saying goes. And I certainly think that a better community was engendered in my classrooms when students later in my career and I became more comfortable and adept at letting the students take control of their own learning. I'm grateful that Dr. Kevin Gannon is here to give us his perspective on how to create communities in our classrooms. And in preparing these remarks, I read several of his blogs. 
And I wanted to share one quote from uh, one of his blogs, which was tagged active learning, but it was actually a blog on uh, banning the ban on technology in classrooms. Uh, he writes, students cannot experience the transformative effects that higher education can and should inculcate if we refuse to treat them as responsible agents who are the co-architects of their learning. If we approach teaching as an assertion of power and imposition of our will, then we fail our students. Only if we invite our students to actively participate in the collective scholarly enterprise that is their collegiate, that is their collegiate education will we succeed. And to me, inviting students into the community of scholars also invites them into the community of hope. Thank you for giving me a few minutes to reflect on, on my own teaching experience, uh, a few minutes to thank you for the efforts that you've made over the last year, to, to wish you the best as we start on a new semester, to hope that in the fall we get back to um, the kinds of experiences that we want for both ourselves and for our students. And uh, I wish you the best, and I, I, I know this will be an engaging afternoon full of great activities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Provost Ingram, Ingram for sharing your insights. We appreciate it. And now I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kevin Gannon, who is the Director of the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning and Professor of History at Grandview University in Des Moines, Iowa. He's the author of Radical Hope, a Teaching Manifesto, published in April 2020 as part of the Teaching and Learning in Higher Education series from West Virginia University Press. Dr. Gannon is a regular contributor to the Chronicle of Higher Education, and his work has also appeared in outlets such as Vox, CNN, and the Washington Post. In 2016, he appeared in the Oscar-nominated documentary, 13th, directed by Ava Devenay, and you can find Kevin online at his blog, thetattooedprofessor.com, and on Twitter, at thetattooedprofessor. At this time, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Gannon, our speaker for this afternoon. Please share an emoji in the chat to welcome Dr. Gannon. Go ahead, Kevin. I'll try that after unmuting my microphone. Good afternoon, uh, and thank you so much uh, for having me here. Uh, you should be able to, on your screen now, see uh, a title slide uh, that coincidentally has the uh, title for this presentation on it, Creating Communities of Hope, with my little editorial uh, emendation underneath and not so hopeful times. Uh, so, if you don't see that, uh, throw a message in the chat and let me know, but I'm going to assume that this uh, awkward transition to Zoom screen sharing uh, has worked. So things got interesting in <laughs> the 24 hours since I had put some of the final touches on my remarks and some of the images that I wanted to share with everyone today. Um, I am a historian by training, uh, a historian actually of race and ra racism and radical political movements in US history. So yesterday was kind of a thing. Uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, right up front that, you know, we're doing faculty development work, but we're doing it in a context uh, where many of us are still trying to process everything that's been occurring and continues to occur, whether it's politically, uh, culturally, socially, oh, by the way, there's a global pandemic that's still occurring. Uh, and I'm going to be honest, you know, it feels a little weird uh, actually, it feels a lot weird uh, to be doing kind of a faculty development workshop as all of these things have, you know, unfolded and continue to unfold in the background. Um, you know, on Twitter yesterday, uh, a friend of mine who was a new faculty member uh, tweeted something out, said, uh, do we still have to do faculty development work uh, when there's a coup going on? Because uh, our faculty manual, uh, new faculty manual doesn't say anything about that. And so I sort of chuckled. Uh, but I think, you know, much as our students are as well, 
uh, you know, we are navigating uncharted waters in so many ways. We've been doing that since March. And it's okay if you don't feel like you have the bandwidth uh, to really be doing a lot of this kind of intense pedagogical reflection and work. Uh, it's okay to feel depleted. Um, I think many of us are, are there. Uh, and so what I invite you to do, uh, and I'm going to move on from this picture, is engage and participate today in ways that work best for you. Um, if you don't have the bandwidth uh, and, and are just sort of here to sort of active or passively just see things and, and you know, get some ideas and and don't have the energy or bandwidth to do anything more than that, that is absolutely fine. Uh, your presence here is enough. Uh, I am going to provide all the materials I used today uh, to Yvonne uh, and via web links, so folks will have access uh, to the, any of the materials I use, as well as the stuff that I link in the slides. So I invite you to be here today in the way that works best for you. And I want to acknowledge the fact that that's going to look different for each one of us that a lot of us uh, are sort of trying to manage a number of different things cognitively and emotionally uh, at this time. Uh, you have a spring semester coming up at my institution here at Grandview University in Des Moines. We started our spring semester on Monday. Uh, so I feel uh, a, you know, a bit like one of those uh, circus performers trying to balance plates and cups and all sorts of spinning objects everywhere. Uh, and I'm not quite sure uh, if I'm going to be able to keep all of them up in the air. Uh, so with that said, again, I'm glad you're here. Um, I'm honored to be invited uh, to spend some time with you this afternoon uh, to think about teaching and learning, to think about our, our, our calling, our sense of vocation, and what it is that we do and, and why we do it, why we do it uh, and care so much about it even in times as just weird and confusing and complex as the ones we're in. So to get us thinking a little bit uh, about what we're looking forward to in the spring, I would like for you in the chat uh, box in Zoom, if you could, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask for a little bit of word association here. Uh, and, and what I'd love uh, for you to be able to do is first in the chat box, if I can get my cursor to the right place, if you could just put, you know, a word or a phrase or something like that that answers this question, what gives you the most anxiety when you think about our upcoming semester? Uh, and I'll let you know, I wrote this question and thought about this uh, yesterday morning, uh, realizing that answers to that might be a little bit different given the intervening events. So seeing a, a lot of things that resonate with me certainly uh, coming through here, um, the bandwidth that we have, motivation, uh, managing technology. Uh, I see uh, one of you has pointed out that you're switching to Zoom and you hope that it works. Uh, as someone who's become basically our account administrator for Zoom at my university, I share those hopes with you on a daily basis. Uh, a lot of things uh, in here, you know, faculty and student fatigue, feeling overwhelmed, exhaustion, uh, managing multiple needs and demands, uh, and of course, you know, the, the real uh, anxiety that hangs over a lot of us uh, as well, getting COVID, uh, health concerns, what happens if me or, or those close to me or my students uh, get sick and, and what do we do? Uh, and then I see a few responses as well where folks are pointing out, you know, loving the live classroom, the face-to-face -face classroom, and, and hoping that, you know, one day we can get back to that sort of thing, right? The things that we love to do, the things that energize us uh, and engage students in ways beyond just sending them a reminder email <laughs> or a post on the learning management system. What I also see in the chat uh, are a number of us who, who identified things that, that I think our students would be able to identify with as well, right? Juggling family and professional responsibility. How am I going to keep things going uh, the way they need to go if I were to get sick or something were to intervene with the lab classes or other classes that I'm responsible for? Uh, I've got two teenage children, one in junior high and one in high school. Uh, doing fully online learning, uh, which is why I'm in my office on campus and not at my house because we don't have the Wi-Fi bandwidth for all three of us to be doing this sort of video conferencing thing at the same time. Uh, 
I think one of the other things that we've identified here and that we've certainly been aware of since our, our shift to sort of emergency remote teaching uh, in March was that, you know, we aren't existing, you know, and our students certainly don't come to us from a vacuum. Uh, and so all of these things that folks are trying to balance, right? Family, health, jobs, professional obligations, teaching, learning, sleeping, uh, getting groceries, you know, if we're in a financially precarious situation, managing all of the sort of bandwidth depletion and anxiety that comes with that. So there's a lot, right? And I think this what this exercise accomplishes, I think it's useful for us to see certainly that we're not the only ones uh, who have the anxieties, who have the things weighing upon us as we approach the semester, uh, that we are not alone, uh, that we have colleagues in the community around us who are also wrestling with these same things. Uh, and so we find our people, right? We find our community, we find our support that way. I think this is worth a conversation worth having with our students as well uh, as we inaugurate the spring semester to show our students the same thing, right? That they are not alone, that they, the concerns, the anxieties, and the things that they're nervous about are not things that are just simply unique to them, uh, but that they share in common with their peers and our communities as well. And sometimes that very simple, although not always apparent, realization uh, could be a powerful insight uh, and very helpful as well. Now, on the other side of the coin, now, what I'd like for you to do, we'll do a little bit of word association again. It may seem sort of odd to ask about this, but what are you most hopeful for in the coming semester? What gives you hope to pursue what it is that we're after coming into this now second semester of weird pandemic teaching? So throw a phrase or a word or your thoughts here in the chat. Seeing a few vaccines, yes, right? Support you're getting from your campus, uh, that's, that's a great thing. Uh, and one that I'm glad to see show up in here. Uh, not the first time doing this. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, there is some comfort. Uh, there are, you know, we've learned a lot uh, from our abrupt shift in the spring. Uh, and really what I love to see here is there's so many of you who are identifying, you know, things that are centered on your students, right? Connecting with your students, helping your students build community. Uh, one of you in the very beginning just put that it is the students alone that, that gives you hope for the coming semester. And I love that, right? Because this is what it's about. Uh, and see what our students have done, right, to persist in their higher educational journey. Uh, is really impressive, uh, you know, and I know on my own campus, we offer some online and hybrid classes in certain programs, but most of our full-time day students do not take those classes. And so when we shifted online for the rest of the spring and then coming into the fall, we, we did hybrid flexible or high flex, there was a significant learning curve. And we had students, you know, who were living in quarantine or two time zones away or multiple time zones away for some of our international students that were still doing everything they could to be in, speaking broadly, class, uh, and to be a part of that community and to continue their educational journey. Uh, and I've never been a big fan of that discourse about, you know, students are coddled and students are snowflakes and all that. And I think if we look at what our students did collectively to be able to continue their education, even when everything else is going on against the backdrop of a global pandemic, that shows some grit and resilience to me. And that fills me with a lot of hope as well. Uh, because I think what we do see is, you know, there wouldn't have been that sort of grit and persistence if, it, if there wasn't a feeling from our students that this was essential and that this was worth it. And who makes it essential? And who makes it feel like it's worth it? The people that our students are in contact with in their academic journeys most often. And that's you in the classroom as their instructor, as their mentor, as their advocate, as their support, as their friend, as their cheerleader, whatever role that might look like in the various shifting contexts of our educational journey during COVID. So there's a lot to look at and feel hopeful about, which may seem a little counterintuitive. You know, it's 
I, I published a book with hope in the title. Uh, the release date was April 1st, right, as COVID was closing everything down. And ever since then, you know, I've had people ask, so, you know, what's your book about? And they'll be like, uh, hope? You know, <laughs> so it may seem sort of weird and counterintuitive, but what I'd like to suggest is that approaching hope as a practice, as an ethic, as a pedagogical philosophy can do a lot to help us sustain uh, the kind of work that it is that we're doing. Uh, and doing so, um, as, as I just saw pointed out in the chat here, you know, the locus of control is external to us. That's a, that's a great way to put it, right? That, you know, we might feel adrift and unmoored. So how, how might we uh, approach the work that we're doing, especially for this spring, with an ethic of hope? What does that look like? What does it look like when COVID refuses to go away right now? Uh, this was the weekend before our spring semester started. My state has, uh, shall we say, not dealt very well uh, with this public health concern. Turns out magical thinking is not a strategy. Uh, so this is the backdrop for yet another semester uh, that we have uh, where, you know, everyone's anxiety level is, seems to be pinned to these numbers which are once again consistently rising. But of course, even in the time of COVID, it certainly wasn't the pandemic uh, that occupied our attention solely. Uh, what, what has happened in the intervening months since COVID really, of course, has you know, laid its footprint across our society is that many of the already open wounds, the sort of ragged edges of injustice and racism and violence in our society were laid bare. We can no longer avoid looking at what is right in front of us. How many of our students are on one side or another of these lines? How many of us in our community? In Charlottesville, the Unite the Right March several years ago, this was the famous photo that came out of that. And this is a photograph that stays with me. Um, this person in the foreground is, or at the time of the photo, was a college student, and he was a history major. Uh, and there was an interview with him where he described how what he was learning in history reinforced his views about the destiny of the white race, as it were, in an ethno-nationalist state. And as a historian who studies race and racism, is it possible and should it be possible for someone to journey through higher education in an academic program like us and, and have that journey give them what they think are the materials to do this, to carry a torch through Charlottesville, Virginia in support of an ethno-nationalist state? How do we have hope with all of this suffusing the nooks and crannies of our public discourse and the very air in which it seems like we and our students are trying to breathe. So when I talk about hope then, I think it's important for me to point out that there are a few things that I am not gonna do. Uh, and, and, and I wanna be very clear about that. Uh, I'm not gonna be a cheerleader. Uh, sometimes we use the term hope, like I have hope in the future, uh, you know, like a Hallmark hard slogan, right? And, and that sort of airy declaration doesn't have any substance to it. If we just say, yes, the future will get better because I have hope. What are we doing there? Are we abdicating our own role and our own responsibility in bringing that future about by sort of offloading that into a vague statement that just because time passes, things will get better? Is that what we're about? I don't think that that's a very fruitful direction for us. And it certainly isn't what I mean when I talk about a practice of hope or building communities of hope in higher education. So I'm not just simply gonna be a cheerleader. I'm not gonna spout you know, vague inspirational phrases at you uh, and, and pretend like it's professional development or meaningful interaction. I am also not going to you know, have a program of five classroom techniques that will solve all of your problems. Uh, there are, I am not gonna promise universal solutions and nothing that I say here today is gonna have applicability across 100% of teaching and learning contexts. The only person who can promise something to fix all the problems you have is Phil Swift here with his Flex Seal family of products. I am not Phil Swift. I cannot fix everything. We cannot fix everything all at once. And we need to, I think, keep that in mind. 
but I'm not going to be a doomsayer either. You know, things are tough, you know, and, and honestly reckoning with that is important. We can't move towards a better future without an honest confrontation with our present. And that honest confrontation with our present in the last 24 hours has gotten really weird and really negative and really complicated. But if we, if we use that to, again, take the off ramp and move into a place of hopelessness, that breeds apathy, that breeds detachment, that breeds cynicism, and all of those places are where teaching and learning go to die. And so, yes, things are back. Uh, but if all we do is forecast doom out of it, again, we are eliding our personal responsibility to do the work to make society better. So let's be honest about where we are, right? Let's, let's have this unflinching look at our present, uh, in both you know, within the sphere of higher education specifically, but then in the larger socio-political context as well. Uh, I'm not telling you anything you don't know when I posit that we are in a unique situation. Uh, as a historian, you know, my sarcastic rejoinder to myself would be every situation is unique. That's why it's called history, right? You know, change is the only constant. But what we have done since March is unprecedented at the scale that we have been attempting to do it. Uh, and we need to acknowledge that. Uh, that is hard work. That has been heavy lifting, and it has depleted a lot of our reserves and our bandwidth. I think we have also learned that fully online or even hybrid flexible or high flex teaching may not be the optimal answer for every teaching and learning situation. At my institution, a small liberal arts college, we are really struggling with how do you replicate the upper level seminar experience, the classic everyone dissecting a text around a small seminar table, how do you optimize that for a class where some people are attending in person and some people are Zooming in via video conferencing? How does that look? It's certainly not the optimal choice, right? And we have to, you know, we have to acknowledge that. There is no one size fits all solution. And on most days, for the most part, neither we or our students are fully okay. And again, it's okay, you know, to not be okay. And if we try as educators ourselves, to always put on that front that everything is great. Our students see through that, we can't sustain it, and it depletes us. You know, as the old saying goes, you can't pour from an empty cup. I think as well, it's really important for us to focus on the fact that sometimes, and the times we're in have some of those occasions, there aren't any great options, right? One of the things that I was really struck by in March as we moved to this sort of emergency remote teaching was there was almost this sense in some of our campus planning groups and administrative work groups that, you know, if we thought hard enough, we could come up with the solution that would answer all the problems we have about having to shift to online learning, that there was something out there, right? And if we innovated or, or discussed or, or got out of the box willingly enough or hard enough, that we would find that perfect kind of silver bullet option. But sometimes that option, in fact, a lot of times that option ain't there. And so I think it's worth thinking about if there aren't any great or perfect options, sometimes we have to be okay with the one that's the least worst. Now that doesn't sound very inspiring. It's certainly not something that marketers or administrators would put in our institutional or strategic language, right? Woo, come to our university because we are the least worst. But again, being honest about where we are, the least worst option is still better than the worst worst option. And so if that's what we need to be about, I'm okay with that. In the times that we're in as well, none of us know completely what we're doing. I am an experienced online instructor. I've done research and writing and consulting on teaching online, even you know, well before COVID times. I still feel lost half the time of you know the classes that I'm teaching, whether it's in a fully online or a hybrid flexible format. A lot of this is new to me, and I am trying to learn in the same breath is where I'm responsible for helping my faculty colleagues learn some of these things as well. And so we have to start from that place of kind of what A.D. Collier calls not yetness. We aren't there yet. Neither are our students. And so if we embrace that not yetness and realize that we are, you know, at points on a continuum, then we're going to be able to have the capacity to do the things that, that we need to be doing. And then finally, right now, things are just kind of crappy for a lot of folks whether they have a relative who's sick or if they're sick or if they're facing the loss of a job 
if our students are significant income earners for their own family situation, all of these things are weighing upon our students in the ways that they weigh upon us and our family members as well. And so as we think about the learning spaces, the teaching and learning spaces that we are creating for our students this spring, we need to make room for the fact that not everybody's gonna have their best selves with them all the time, and sometimes not even some of the time. Other than that, everything's great. So if you've seen the Lego movie, I guarantee you, you now have this song running through your head. So you are welcome for that earworm. Uh, but again, you know, there's, there's a difference between being cynical, I think, and being honest about where we are. Uh, and if we want to have any hope of having a practice that brings about a better status quo, that brings about the type of meaningful change that we see higher education can do, we need to be unflinchingly honest about our presence and what our options are within it. And so what are the lessons then that we get from this spring shift to emergency remote teaching? Uh, what are those lessons? What can we no longer ignore about our students and our students learning? Uh, so we have, you know, a lot, I've heard a lot of rhetoric about, you know, whether it's in higher ed or just socially in general, like, wow, we can't run from this fact anymore, right? And I think COVID has laid bare some of the things that we do kind of at least on an intellectual level, but maybe not on the personal or visceral level that we do now. So once again, I, I, I'm going to invite you to use this chat window here because uh, we are going to save the chat log from this presentation. Um, and what I'm interested in are what are the things that you feel like you can no longer ignore? Not to say that you were ignoring it before, but what has now stood out in maybe more urgent or kind of fresh relief for you since our shift to kind of pandemic instruction in March? What are some of the truths that you think need to be front and center for us. So fairly consistently already I'm seeing in the chat, you know, equity, inequities, problems with equities, uh, and student anxiety as well. Uh, structural inequity and access to resources, uh, the amount of struggle that our students are going through uh, I saw the disconnect between my lived experience and that of my students. Absolutely. I think about this a lot, uh, right? Um, mental health and the impacts on student learning. What are our students' burdens? What are they carrying with us? Uh, students are not in school to become academic professionals. They are in school to learn to survive. Uh, that's a great insight. Uh, why are our students here and why why are they doing the things they feel they need to do to persist? What is their end goal and what have they been told is important about this educational journey that they are on? Uh, mental health issues, anxieties. We knew, you know, the research was showing us even before COVID uh, that student mental health was one of the most rapidly expanding areas of concern, not just for student life professionals, but for higher education in general. Uh, about 30% of our students were entering college with a diagnosis of anxiety, social anxiety, or some other mental health issue that they self-reported, the students self-reported, could pose significant barriers to their learning, right? And that's before COVID. That's before the summer we had. That's before everything that has unfolded this fall and into, into early 2021, right? That is not going to go away. The students who are in high school now, you know, I think of my daughter as a, as a high school sophomore. You know, what happens as a result of this? You know, students who are coming of intellect, you know, coming of age in an intellectual sense, students who are intellectually maturing, uh, students who are beginning this journey in higher education or, or contemplating doing that very soon. Think about from that student's perspective, how many institutions have failed them? as they have been coming of age intellectually. What are the effects of that? This is gonna be a set of questions that are with us for a really long time. Uh, and as you've identified here in the chat, and you know this, right? I'm not telling you anything that you're unaware of, but the scale and scope of the work that we are gonna to need to be about in terms of creating community, in terms of creating spaces where meaningful, challenging learning can occur, 
but in, do so in ways that acknowledge our students' humanity and everything that comes with that. Uh, as you know, as uh, Therese puts here in the chat, empathy is more important than ever. Absolutely. Absolutely. And education, certainly higher education at its best, helps provide our students a set of tools with which they can develop the capacity for empathy, for seeing things from another, the other's perspective and understanding all of the impacts that that has. So the work that we are about is crucial. And so the second part of this question that I've shared up on the screen here with you, I think is a really important one. Now that we have this knowledge or that we've seen this knowledge kind of re-emphasized or reaffirmed for us, what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do about that? And I want to, I'm going to invite you to hold on to some thoughts about that question uh, because we're going to come back to it a little bit later on in the afternoon in terms of what are we going to do with the knowledge, with the experience, with the perspective that we have gained uh, since March. So that was a really long introduction focusing on a lot of really negative sort of things to start, a, uh, to start a discussion about hope, right? And so you're probably thinking to yourself, this was called Communities of Hope. We've been going for a while now, and all we're talking about is everything that sucks. Uh, so, you know, I want my money back, right? This is where I think we need to really think about what it means when we say we want to build a practice sustained in hope, and build communities of hope in higher education. Uh, Rebecca Solnit's wonderful essay that she wrote back in late 2004, early 2005, I think, called Hope in the Dark. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, I go back to it often. Uh, and, and I think what Solnit talks about when she, when she talks about the idea of hope and acting from a place of hope uh, is, is, is a way for us to conceive of this that, that is a really important uh, and, and really, I think, essential way for us to frame our practice. Hope is not a lottery ticket, so that says that you can sit on the sofa and clutch feeling lucky, right? Hope is, in other words, not something where you can say, I have hope that the future will get better, and then just assume that it will by magic, right? Hope, she says, is an ax that you break down the doors with in an emergency. Pretty vivid metaphor, right? The first time I read it, I got that scene from The Shining in my head where Jack Nicholson kind of axes through the hotel door or the motel door here, Johnny, you know, it's, you know, maybe that's not the way we want to do it, but right, this is, this is a vivid metaphor and it's done by design, right? This is an act with which we break down doors into the emergency to hope, so that says, is to give yourself to the future. And most importantly, that commitment to the future is what makes the present inhabitable. So notice that hope, uh, when, when Soldat talks about hope here, she's not saying everything is great now and so you hope to sustain that into the future. What, what Soldat is, is asking and suggesting and, and recommending that we do is the worse our present conditions seem to be, the more urgent this commitment to the future becomes. Because how else does the present become inhabitable other, otherwise? So there's actually some really interesting research that's been done by folks like Peter Felton out of Elon University and, and, and colleagues uh, in what this idea of hope means in terms of practice and improvement for college students. You know, what does hope look like for a first year college student who has not been academically successful and runs up against that, that first semester GPA barrier of adversity, right? How do we instill a sense of hope in the soulmate sense for our students, right? That, you know, we are going to commit to a better future, uh, which is what will give meaning to our, shall we say, unpleasant present, right? So what does that look like for students? And what Felton uh, comes up with is almost sort of a mathematical equation. For students to feel that they have a meaningful sense of hope, Felton argues, two key components need to be in place. One, they have to have a sense of agency. And so in other words, if there's a better future out there for a particular student, that student has to understand that they have a role, perhaps the role to play in bringing about that better future. But that sense of agency alone isn't enough, isn't sufficient by itself, because we also need a sense of direction, pathways, 
on how to employ that agency to actually bring about that better future outcome. Uh, so in my own undergraduate experience, um, I think really this resonates with me, this equation resonates with me, because in my own undergraduate experience, my first semester was kind of a disaster. Um, I had graduated high school from Fairfax County, Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. It's one of the wealthiest and most well-resourced school districts in the entire country. I did not come from wealth, but due to the magic of school districting, I went to a well-resourced school uh, that did. I did well in high school, uh, because, and I didn't really know how I did well, but I did well enough to go to college. But I didn't have, in retrospect, I didn't have the tools or the aptitudes in my sort of intellectual or cognitive toolbox to deal with the ratcheting up now of expectations, as well as the increase in unstructured time. Uh, so I was used to doing well without, with, quite honestly, without a whole lot of effort. You know, I was kind of a juvenile delinquent punk in high school. I came to college and sort of extended that particular course of study. My first semester was the first F I'd ever gotten in my life a D in a four credit calculus class and getting kicked out of the university honors program uh, after just one semester because of my grades. I, you know, it was a reality check. I had made some bad choices, adopted some, shall we say, unproductive strategies, but I didn't see a way out. And so that initial feeling, and I remember this vividly, like, what the hell am I going to do? You know, sitting at home over that holiday break, like, I, you know, I've been in college for a semester and I'm screwed. I've lost a scholarship. I've lost the honors program. I've lost some of the things I'm depending on to pay tuition. And how am I going to fix this? So I didn't know if I could. And I certainly didn't know what pathways were available to me to fix that situation. Uh, now, ultimately, I was able to benefit from some great faculty advising and from some of my own peers who helped me find the structure uh, that my first semester had been lacking. And it was an uneven journey after that, but ultimately I did graduate and go on to graduate school. Uh, but I vividly remember that sense of hopelessness. And so how many of our students are in that place if the fall semester, for example, was their first collegiate semester? And they're trying to navigate all the things that go along with college in this weird environment. How do they get things better? How do our students see hope? We need to create spaces where students are able to define their agency, but see the pathways that they can take towards that better outcome in the future as well. And in fact, you can even modify this equation a little bit. And so rather than hope equaling agency plus pathways, maybe hope is uh, the product of multiplying agency and more than one pathway. How do we get our students to a place where they can see their own agency but where they can also identify the paths, the steps, the actions, the commitments that they need to make. And how do we support and affirm them in those actions and commitments to help them operate from a place of hope? Hope is, as Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educator and writer put it, an ontological need. In other words, it is basic for us trying to make sense, to know, to understand the context in which we find ourselves. But in order for it to be, to satisfy that ontological need, Frere says, hope demands an anchoring in practice. Hope is the ax with which you break down the door in an emergency. And so it's one thing to, to say we will create communities based on this practice, this ethic, this stance grounded in hope. But that hope has to be operationalized. The agency and pathways part has to be there. I'm a big fan of critical theory uh, as well. And even if you're not, there's still a really vivid quote from the Italian Marxist philosopher Antonio Gramsci. Uh, the crisis, and he was talking about the crisis of the 1920s as Italy descended into fascism, consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. And in this interregnum, Gramsci says, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Uh, the full Eastern European uh, Slovenian philosopher Slavo Zizek translated this line from Gramsci a little more poetically, and I've got that here at the bottom as well. The old world is dying and the new world struggles to be born, but now is the time of monsters. And again, that language you made, the first blush of this may, you know, you may think this seems overwrought, this seems overdramatic. 
but this is the tribe of monsters in many ways. And so how do we, and how do we help our students be in this space where it appears, at least in many direct and relevant ways, that while the old world may be dying and the new world is struggling to be born, we are now in this interregnum, this time of monsters, threatening, scary, touching upon the very base of our anxieties and fears. And that can produce some really powerful impulses and behaviors and frames of reference for our students, which can make things really difficult and problematic as well. So given that, what is a pedagogical praxis? That is a blending of theory and practice rooted in hope look like? And what does a pedagogical praxis rooted in hope look like during the time of monsters? What might that be? And what might it look like in a largely online world, as such as the one in which many of us are navigating now? And so one principle I wanna put out in front of us right away is that when we make decisions based in fear, we start to act like hoarders. We want to bring all the things that the resources that we think we need to survive and that we see as scarce we want to clutch those things even tighter right i'm in a desert i gotta hoard all the water i can find because that gives us i have the stuff right so now i feel like i'm more in control of the situation and i think one thing that we need to be able to acknowledge is that for many of us and i know this is the case for me when we did this shift to emergency remote instruction in the spring, and now many of us are teaching in blended or online environments that are unfamiliar to both us and our students, the biggest sense that we have is a loss of control, right? 